Thank you, John. Um, we, we would like to actually thank the local organizing committee and John Sigliano for his forethought in, in thinking um, about this as a topic for a plenary because we think it's, it's time has come and it's an incredibly important um, discussion. So thanks, John, for, for having us. It's a great honor to be here. Um, so as you heard, Michael Foster uh, came to his first Society for Conservation Biology meeting in 2006. And at the end of the first day, I checked up with him like I like to do and I, um, with people who are new to a meeting, and I said, how's it going? And he said, um, I should actually, I think I need my, I'm going to wean myself of that, um, of that microphone. So, Michael, so at Michael, I said, Michael, how's it going? How, how, what, are you, what are you learning? What's going on? He said, you know, everybody's really friendly, and they come up to me, and they pat me on the back, and they say, Michael, I'm so glad you're here. And he says, and then I start to talk to them about my science, and they kind of walk away. And he said, I'm here. They, they, they're happy I'm here because I'm a black man. They don't really care about my science. And he, he said, I feel like a bug under glass. And we giggled a little bit about seeing Michael as a bug under glass. And um, then we talked about what we could do. So Michael was in his first year at Bard, where I was teaching, and uh, we decided that he um, really wanted to do his, his master's degree, his second master's degree, on this issue. And he researched it and thought about it, and was very careful about identifying the issues, the problems, and the potential solutions. And then uh, after he graduated, we uh, brought um, we had the opportunity to have him work at the American Museum of Natural History, where, as, as uh, John said, he, he helped co-found the a Diversity and Conservation Science Initiative. So we really miss him, and we're glad that <coughs> here in Baltimore we can follow on with a lot of the things that he's doing. You need this. Um, not yet. Okay. Is it okay if I go back and forth between, if I stand here? Yeah. Okay. Good. Because I have a walker. Um, so thank you for having me here. Uh, I especially want to thank all of you. Thank the Society for Conservation Biology for hosting me. Um, thank you, John, for this, this, this session. Uh, very inspired by your leadership. Um, and I want to also thank my um, colleague in crime up here, um, Eleanor. Uh, we actually met just less than a year ago, and Michael had a, a, a strong uh, role in that. Um, while I've never met Michael, um, apparently there was some connections with overlapping of our work. So I'm very um, thankful, and I'm very, um, I, I love, Eleanor, I love your leadership in this work, and it's been an honor and pleasure to see you in action at this conference. Uh, she's, she's been working a lot with her students and uh, help, help multitasking with other diversity sessions um, and getting the job done, so I appreciate that. Um, I'm also really honored and very excited to be here because I love wildlife and, and, and biodiversity. Um, I grew up with an innate love for wildlife and biodiversity. I was the one person in my family. First of all, my family didn't uh, go out hike or camping or go outdoors at all, but I still loved wildlife. Um, so my window of the world was in the corner of my mom and dad's room in front of the eight inch black and white. I know some of you know this one with the little knobs. And I, my window to the outdoor world is Marty Stouffer's Wild America. Loved it, loved it. Um, and and all, even though the rest of my family might have thought, you know, I don't know what's going on with Marcel, but we'll let him do what he needs to do. And next thing you know, um, I'm pursuing a career in this work. Uh, that's how strong my wildlife, uh, my love for wildlife is. And monitoring pipe and plovers on the Massachusetts coastline when I was in grad school was my dream job, it, and I loved it. Um, there's just a certain peace and connection. Um, I'm sure many of you know what that's like when you're out in the outdoors with wildlife. Um, I want to get back there. Um, I haven't done it in a while, uh, but we have work to do. Michael's story, unfortunately, is not a unique story. Um, for many people of color, people in non-dominant identities, and we could go into that a little later, what that means, there's a lot of challenges. For me, um, my first job out of grad school, I worked in a national wildlife conservation group, and I learned within the first week I was the only person of color on the whole national staff, conservation staff. Um, I, I used to not like to talk about it. Um, it was tough, it was isolating, it was hard to understand. I wasn't succeeding in that job. The, um, the work that I did, working on biodiversity, was a dream. 
but the work situation was, to be blunt, a nightmare. There were a lot of things that I faced, whether I wanted to talk about it or not, of th things such as um, uh, ignorant comments, such as I'm part Asian, um, referring to my people as little Orientals. Orientals of furniture, not of people. Um, so it was tough. And what one thing led to another was um, I started to talk to other people of color in same situations across the country. We'll define people of color later. Um, same situation of isolation and challenges, their voice being suppressed, having to leave part of themselves out of the door before they come into work. Not being, being everyone hurts in that situation, not the, just the person of color, but the organization does too. They're not getting the full potential from this person. So one thing led to another. I started the Environmental Professionals of Color, uh, which is now over 850 people across the country, uh, people of color working on various environmental issues. And we're actually starting our DC chapter tonight. I'll be leaving after the talk to go kick that off. So that's really exciting. So my calling in connection to this work and why I'm really excited to be here right now with you, my calling is to protect biodiversity. It was and it still is. I'm now indirectly doing that work by doing foundational work that we as a field, as a movement, as a society need to be working on diversity, equity, inclusion if we want to be successful now and far into the future. So it's a real honor and privilege for me to be here because it's really about time to evolve, to become a more diverse movement so we could be more relevant and successful far into the future. We only get one of these, so we got to switch back and forth. So um, this is an overview of our talk today. We're going to um, present to you what our vision of what diversity is and um, some examples of why we think it's important to diversify across our field and the challenges that we face in doing so. And we want to be clear about what can be done, and we have some very specific recommendations for the Society for Conservation Biology. But we also want to wake you up, because it is the afternoon, and we'd like you to Look around you, reach out to someone in the room that you don't know. Hopefully it's someone pretty nearby. Um, and together, for about three minutes, discuss why is diversifying the field of conservation important to me. And as you're thinking about it and starting to uh, bring your information, bring your thoughts together, we set up a Twitter account for you to, be, for you to tweet. Um, IC, uh, hashtag ICCB Diversity. And as you think of things, send those responses to us, and my wonderful colleagues in the front row here are going to come up, and then we're going to talk about this a little bit. So you have about three minutes to find someone nearby who you don't know and have a, a neat conversation about why is diversifying the field of conservation important to me. You thought you were just, you thought you were just going to listen to us talk, didn't you? <laughs> Surprise. They, they probably nah. don't. <laughs> wow, there's nice. actually some really neat connections being made. I'm just yeah. looking across people who. Love it. So maybe like 2.35, maybe? Yeah, that sounds about right. 35, we're supposed to go to 3 something, so I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe I should ask, uh, let me ask John what the... Okay.
You, you want to ask Mary? I know I'm doing the next slide, I think. Yeah, so. good. Um, I, I thought, I think it'd be good for you to do it just to say okay. here's what we're learning, and then you were going to say... Um, the next thing is the process. Yeah. Talking about the process. Yeah, yeah. 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 okay. Because that was why I was thinking you just go straight from that into okay. the process. All right. Sounds good. So... Uh, support and celebrate your differences. That's a nice one. Okay. All right. Stream. Are we just choosing or we We're want to? We're choosing a couple. I don't think okay. we should do them all. I mean, ones that are less maybe, maybe challenging stereotypes. I like that one because it comes in later. It's a nice one because it's from yeah. the eye, personal. Yep. Um, that's good. How about those? Sure. So we're at three minutes. I like the celebrating. Okay. Yeah, right. I put that in there, I think. I think I put that in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fast three minutes, huh? I can't get you to talk. Stop. Look at you. All right. As I do when I facilitate, wrap up that last idea and come back. Awesome. Eleanor and, I, Eleanor and I were just talking about how the beautiful hum of you all connecting and talking across difference. I want to share a couple things that were hash, hashtagged or tweeted. Tweeted. I'm get, trying to get, get my language. Right. Tweeted. A um, so asking, why is diversifying the field of conservation important to me? A diversity of viewpoints gives us a bigger toolbox for designing solutions. Diversity to me is a powerful inclusion of individuals from all backgrounds and locations with valuable experience and knowledge that strengthens communities at every level. Wow, long one. To me, diversity means a group of people who support and celebrate their differences. And lastly, otherwise conservation will never be mainstream. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, so how did that feel? To, to connect across the difference, find someone you don't really know and start talking to them. Good? Thumbs up? <laughs> Felt good? Was, it, was, there, was there a little bit of discomfort? Yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, that's kind of normal when you meet someone new. But you did it, and we love it, and we thank you. And um, you want let me get, thing? yeah, I need that thing. <laughs> um, you know why we love it so much? Because the process, what you just did, connecting across difference, that's the work. And we're going to talk about dimensions, our, our diversity. Our di diversity is all the ways we are different, similar, and unique. We all bring diversity to who we are and our relationships and even those interactions you just did. So I want to emphasize that because oftentimes we get, and we work, my organization works with environmental groups and environmental leaders, um, many who want very linear processes. I want to, I'm going to do diversity, but I want this goal and this outcome. And then when they don't necessarily reach it, they feel the effort has failed. But we like to bring it back to the process. What happened when you as a group, you as a leader, are going through this process. How are you connecting with people across difference? What are the learnings at those points? The relationship building, the trust building. What are the challenges? Just because you bring diversity together doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to be beautiful and perfect, right? I should say it'd be beautifully imperfect, right? So how the real challenge around diversity, I, I, I don't know if it's a challenge because I like it is those connections and the process. What can you learn and from that process and how can you move that mantle forward from that? So thank you for, for, for working with us on that. So I talked a little bit about what is diversity, all the ways we are different, similar, and unique, and, and that's the, the definition that we hold. Some examples may include, I mean, there's, there's some of the ones you hear a lot, uh, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, uh, sexual orientation, gender, 
Um, there's age. I also want to bring up, there's other things such as learning styles, perspective, your experience, the region you come from, the culture you come from, um, how your approaches. These are all pieces that make us who we are. And there's also, a, there's, if, if you want to go to a workshop, we have a whole day workshop on that with a diversity wheel that shows all the different dimensions of diversity, and we explore those together. A few other terms that, I'm, um, that we're going to use today are equity, inclusion, and people of color. Um, so if diversity is our makeup, who we are. Um, equity is that analysis of how our identities interact with each other. Um, what is the power and privilege that interacts within our identities? Um, how are our identities, how, how do we have a dominant identities and non-dominant identities? Um, so I like to bring up the example that um, my, one of my dominant identities um, as gender is being male. I have the unearned privilege and power of being a male in this society. This society that was created by men and a lot of our institutions and the legacy of the creation of, of our nation still unearned, provides unearned favor for men. Um, so that's part of that analysis of power and privilege. Inclusion is, is, the, is we're referring to that as the behavior. How are people being valued and respected? Even in your interaction right there, how did you approach that interaction? Was there, was there value and respect going back and forth? Um, is there, are there ways you can improve? Is, was, it per, you know, was it perfect? Um, so how do we provide these inclusive atmospheres where all people are being valued and respected? And then um, the last term I'm going to share with you, and there's probably going to be a few other terms as we go through, um, but these are kind of the, the more uh, common ones that we're going to use. People of color. Um, I know there's a lot of perspectives on that, and, and it seems like it's, probably, it's, it, it's a term founded in the U.S. and probably a more commonly used term in the United States. So um, people of color, for me, my definition of how I use it is people who self-define in the United States as non-white, and usually that's, um, that's, that's blacks, Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, and, um, and sometimes Arab Americans. And it's, it's people who self-define. And so some Arab Americans self-define, and some don't as people of color. And there is the shared uh, oppressed experience of, from these, these communities um, in the United States. There's a whole other workshop if you want to go in more detail on that, too. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about why diversity is important, why diversify. I'm going to give you the perspective from the work that I do with the Center for Diversity in the Environment. Our mission is to racially and ethnically diversify the U.S. environmental movement. So why is it important? Uh, for one, it's our moral responsibility. Uh, for many of us, it's part of our values. It's the right thing to do. And not only is it the right thing to do, but it's also the wise thing to do. Uh, a lot of studies out there, and, and Eleanor's going to talk a little bit more about those, um, show that create, bringing together diverse groups, diverse organizations, um, can create a higher level of success. It could bring in more supporters, uh, more votes, uh, more funding, a variety of funding sources, individual donors, um, volunteers. It, in, in essence, it could just broaden the base of what you're doing. And as referred to one of, um, one of the feedback on the tweets was, otherwise conservation will never be mainstream. So if you think about diversity, can help us become more mainstream. So here's, here in the United States, the population of people of color is increasing at high rates. Um, just this last month, Latinos became the majority in California. There's more Latinos in California than whites now. First state in our, in our nation where that's happened. There's a lot of cities that are more than 50% people of color. There's other states out of outside of California, such as New Mexico and Hawaii and Texas, that are now over 50% people of color. Um, last year, babies born in the United States were over 50% people of color, and I like to say post-European settlement. 
because there are a lot of Native Americans that are here before white people showed up. In 2019, the U.S. child population will be over 50% people of color. And by 2043, not 3,204. Yeah. Uh, there. By 2043, there's been estimates actually between 2033 and 2043, um, a number of different sources that show that, that the threshold will meet that threshold of 50% people of color within the next 20, 30 years. That's funny. <laughs> um, I'm glad I caught that. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, is where, where's the gap? So currently, the United States is about 36.3% people of color. Um, some studies by Natural Resources Council of America, the Training Resources for Environmental Community have shown that 4 to 11% of staff and boards of environmental organizations are people of color. And I think most of those analyses were um, nonprofit organizations. And those numbers hold uh, true with the organizations that we work with as well. Um, the Multicultural Environmental Leadership Development Initiative out of the University of Michigan, led by uh, Professor Darcita Taylor, um, a study from them showed that 33% of mainstream environmental organizations and about 22% fourth to fifth of government agencies actually had no people of color on staff. So there's a gap, right, of what's represented in, in our groups and what's, what's represented in society. And I want to say a caveat about numbers. Um, many times we get so caught up, or people we work with get very caught up in the numbers. We want to get 22% now, 30% now. Um, I want to say something about numbers. Numbers um, can tell you something, but it's not the end game. Don't be so focused on numbers that you forget to do, create inclusive cultures, for example. Look at equity. Th think about other things. Uh, numbers are good if they're part of a broader strategy. So, just want to let you know by 2050, mid-century, there's going to be 236 million people of color. That's more than double today, um, which is an incredible increase. The other thing I want to share is that people of color support environmental issues at higher rates than whites. I'm going to show you a survey, a poll, that was conducted a couple years ago, commissioned by the, Nur the Nature Conservancy. It was a poll that asked people, voters, what are they concerned about on a wide range of issues, including environmental issues. It's the first national survey of its kind uh, based on race. And what we find is that anywhere from pollution to global warming to loss of habitat, natural areas, that people of color are more concerned at 14 to 22 percentage points higher, except for loss of working farms and ranches which is even, and I don't have an explanation. I know some of you are wondering why, because it's always a question. Um, so 14 to 22 percentage points higher. How many of you, is this new information for you? Okay. How many of you um, knew, knew, have seen some of these polls and surveys before? Okay, great, there's some of you. Um, the great thing, or another interesting thing, great from my perspective, um, about this study, there was a follow-up question asked if you'd be willing to pay for, for solutions to your concerns. And across all socioeconomic levels, poor to rich, people of color are more willing to pay. And that is not a unique survey, actually. The only one on a national level, but there's been a number on regional level, state levels, local levels, that over the past 11 years that showing people of color supporting environmental issues at higher rates than whites, six of which were just this last election year in 2012. And do it, a number of you didn't know that. Why? Why don't we know this information? This seems like pretty important information, right? We want to know, don't we want to know who's going to support our work, especially a demographic that we haven't been overtly successful connecting with? So I'm just going to leave it at that. Why? why? Why are we not seeing this information? Even on the Nature Conservancy's websites, you can't find that information. I have a contact there who, who makes sure I ask for the information so I could have it still live on our website. It's really important. 
So what are some of the challenges with this work? I told, I said, let's not focus on numbers, but there, there is challenges around numbers. Um, so what else should we look at? Um, there's not only recruitment, but retention issues. Um, there are a few role models of people of color looking up to other people of color. Um, there's lack of uh, effective outreach and working with communities of color. Um, the how-to, there's so many people interested in wanting to do diversity work, which shows the success of our organization, which we started the year in 2008 when the economic downturn, <laughs> not the smartest time to start an organization. Um, but we're around and we're growing, and there's a reason why, because there's a real need for people to know how to do this work. And we have a, the pleasure and the honor of working so many unbelievable leaders and organizations across the country to do that. Um, the one thing I want to focus on is this, I'm facing your way, top left one, the homogenous culture, the or I also call the unintentionally exclusive culture, because I, I don't think it's anybody's intent right, to have the lack of racial diversity in the movement, but we're, we're, we're the way we are. Um, so I want to talk about this term, because I, I, I want to talk about this issue because I think it's, it's the root issue that we need to focus on. I think a lot of those other places can be like, for example, numbers will increase if we get this right. Um, the tyranny of fleece. So the story behind this is, have any of you been to the Land Trust Alliance annual rally conference? Okay. Any of you in the 2007 one in Denver? No, okay. Um, one. Um, so I, I, went to, I went to the conference, there's over 1,200 people across the country working on land conservation in the United States. Um, I, was, uh, I just wrote a chapter, co-wrote a chapter with my, um, um, one of my mentors, Charles Jordan, in this, in this book called Diversity, of the, Diversity and the Future of the U.S. Environmental Movement. I might have butchered that. Um, but I wrote a chapter, and, and another, I was with another woman who wrote a chapter as well. We're going to this conference, we're gonna present on it and share um, our findings. Um, this is the first time um, my colleague uh, has gone to the Land Trust Alliance conference. So the morning before we, we, um, we were presenting, we had breakfast and she's just like, so I'm asking her, how's it going? How's the conference going? And she's like, oh my gosh, it's like the tyranny of fleece. Everywhere I look, fleece, fleece, fleece jackets, fleece vests, T-shirts under fleeces, ties and, ties and nice shirts under fleeces. It's fleece everywhere, right? And I'm like, and I was just giggling because I've been to the Land Trust Alliance Conference for a while. And, and for me, she kind of like pulled some things I was dealing with on a personal level. Um, when I started with a conservation group um, back, in, back in 2000, I was like, now I could wear my fleece. Right? Before it was kind of like, oh, I could kind of wear a fleece, but, but it was my badge of acceptance. I'm like, you know what? I'm a conservationist. I'm working for a wildlife group. I got my fleece. I'm, I'm, it. I'm, I'm in. I'm in the club, right? So I want, I want to talk about that because um, there are certain ways, because her reaction was kind of like, she, it, was, it was, for her, it was a little bit. Um, kind of on the negative side, but for her it was kind of like, uh, like, I could tell she was struggling with it. Like, I don't feel fully included because it seems like there's this, this club over here, this community. And I want to point that out, um, not to make fun and judge because I, I did go through my own evol evolution of, for a while, I was, a, I was a rebellious fleece wearer. I would not wear fleece. Um, and then I went on a hike and I live in Portland and I said, you know, I could really use a fleece right now. <laughs> um, so, so I've come full circle, but I've dealt with some issues. This is my process. This is my work that I'm, I'm dealing with, right? Um, so, but I want to bring this up because there's certain ways we, I mean, you can think of you as a society, as the field, as your, your academic institution, your organization. There's ways where we create community and culture among ourselves. And I would say that's good. It's good to create community and culture. But if you want to make this next step to be about inclusion, well, you need to take a self-assessment of who you are. And you do it on the individual level, too. Who you are, how are you projecting yourself to the outside world? Um, all the, all, 
how, how are the set policies and practices of your organization and how you do it, how is it excluding people? Um, the ways we uh, view how people should succeed, getting degree, 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 or moving up in a certain way in your organization, are there certain ways we, are we excluding? Are we just valuing, for example, the linear, the ones that could think fast, uh, those that look a certain way, dress a certain way? You feel that they would be great representatives out in the outside world, right? And, and often, those, those, that culture and that community, there's often unwritten rules, right? So there's like no rule that you have to wear a fleece to be a part of the land trust community, right? Um, but it's become part of the community and, and, and my interpretation, even though it wasn't a rule, coming into conservation was, you know, I can be fully accepted now. I could really own and, and, and wear this fleece. Um, I want to say, um, this is a little side note, and I'm not making this up, but when I did a keyword search for, for images fleece, um, the first one that came up was actually a land trust group. And this is, <laughs> this is a land trust group. <laughs> so, uh, is this here? yeah, okay. thanks. thanks. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> thanks, Marcelo. I think that was a good overview of some of the issues, um, some of the challenges, and some of the opportunities that we face in the United States in thinking about diversifying the conservation or environmental movement. I'm going to take a step back and think a little bit more broadly about our global efforts. And I want to um, remind everybody how complex biodiversity conservation is. If it were easy, we'd all be on vacation right now instead of uh, in Baltimore at a conference center. Um, and I think everybody in the audience, or most people in the audience, would agree that we need effective critical thinking tools in order to address these complex biodiversity conservation issues. We need to be analyzing. We need to be listening. We need to be questioning. We need to be moving beyond stereotyping conceptions in order to evaluate information and solve the problems that we're facing. And I looked a lot into the literature about effective decision making, and there's a lot of really neat work out there that looks at, at um, how different groups perform. And apparently, different groups, when they're engaged in problem solving and something that's meaningful for them, um, are more effective than um, diverse groups, are more effective than homogenous groups, particularly if they've had training in how to work together. And interestingly, the the uh, differences between the uh, homogenous groups and the diverse groups were not just that the, the um, new individuals brought new information or new perspectives. Those who were traditionally in power in the experiments that we read about were mostly Caucasians. They processed complex information better when they were in the diverse group. They were more thorough in their deliberations. They used a wider range of information they were more factually accurate in their discussion of evidence. They were more amenable to discussing controversial, controversial issues. And in newer research, they appear to be more creative and innovative as a group because of the diversity and because of the change in uh, people who are traditionally in the homogenous groups. So I would argue that in this left-hand box, the list that I just came up with of the, of the characteristics of these diverse groups with training, um, those are the things that we want to foster in critical thinking. We want to use effective conservation evidence from a variety of sources, knowledge bases, and perspectives to solve these problems, and this can help us to broaden the horizons when we work with diversity. So I want to give you another example of why um, diversity may be useful for us in thinking about conservation problems. We have a, a habit in the conservation arena to try to simplify things so that we work at the level where we actually have agency or ability to make a difference, and uh, where we try to block out some of the things that we really don't have any uh, ability to, to change, and we focus in on what we know. And I'm going to use as an example a um, research project by a, graduate, a former graduate student and now graduated student of mine, Leo Douglas, who hails from Jamaica. He's in the lower right-hand side of the picture. And he worked in Dominica and uh, was very interested in the two endemic parrots who live there. And in um, the research that he was doing, he was recognizing that there was a crisis. And there used to be a decline in the parrot population, and then there was a wonderful conservation education campaign that was very successful, run by the government and a not-for-profit, that led to a decrease in hunting and trade of these parrot populations, which led to a, an increase in the parrot population, which is something that a conservation biologist loves to see. 
But simultaneously, there was an increased deforestation and habitat loss, and then farming that was becoming adjacent to these parrot habitats. And that whole combination of problems, of things, led to a problem where the parrots were eating the uh, farmers' fruits, in particular um, uh, oranges. And that led to a human wildlife conflict, which uh, resulted in farmers killing the parrots, and there were very few parrots, so that led to people wanting to, to do something, they came up with a suite of solutions that just weren't working. And Leo came in in the middle of this and um, took a look at this um, linear view of what was happening, this somewhat maybe reductionist, even the well-intended view of what was happening, and he um, worked with other people to say, where else can we help to understand why the solutions that seemed sensible are not working? And he ended up... Uh, interviewing people to think about the underlying global trade issues. And it turns out that a lot of the farmers where this conflict was happening used to be banana farmers, but there was a decline in banana revenue because of global free trade policy, and people were going into these fruit crops that were of particular interest, more interest to the, to the parrots. There were also fewer uh, farmers going into the, um, the fruit crop industry, so you had a lot of folks retiring, and retired farmers prefer citrus to bananas. Um, you also had an almost simultaneous uh, disease issue, an agricultural disease issue that uh, made fruits uh, that the parrots were eating more valuable. And in particular, what Leo was able to see by talking to farmers and to the government and to the policemen and to the Ministry of Agriculture, um, he realized that at the root of a lot of these problems was this perception by the farmers of poor support from the government, in particular because of their... Um, the decline in the banana revenue from the glo glo uh, global free trade policy. And that was essentially causing this enormous animosity towards this bird, these birds that were to them representing the government because of that campaign that made that bird an important um, bird for the government and, for, and, and a valuable um, icon for the country. And so Leo was able to say, you know, the reason why this um, focus on the left-hand side of this, uh, this graph is not working is because there's a lot more underneath that. So taking a systems level view and understanding from a variety of different perspectives and taking an interdisciplinary diverse perspective can help you to understand the various points where you can intersect with these problems and, and work towards a solution. Um, of course, there's some challenges with the systems perspective. Um, it certainly takes time. Leo did an amazing job being able to interview these various groups of folks and listen deeply to what their, their issues were and then to come up with that complex graphic. Um, so it takes time to grasp the lar larger system. You also at some point need to cut off um, your, your exploration because everything's connected to everything else and you could spend an enormous time, you know, all, all of a sudden going all around the world with oranges and bananas and um, parrots. So you need to set some boundaries on what you address and you need people who can synthesize across difference and that's really important and something that we're starting to do a lot more of in um, conservation. Thank you. So I want to talk about different levels like, like diversity. It's, this is such a vast and can be seen as this intractable issue, uh, this problem facing us, especially if you start analyzing all the systemic and institutional challenges we face. Um, so one thing, a um, model that's really helped um, the Center for Diversity and Environment us to do our work, uh, and as it shows, it keeps on playing itself over and over again, is, is to break it down. How do we create change on the individual level? How can I do my work? How could I be better at working on an interpersonal level? Um, and then how do I then expand that uh, work to my sphere of influence around me, to my organization? Um, and then overall, how are we improving and pushing the mantle forward uh, along the whole field and movement? You could even think there could be a bigger circle of society in general. Um, on an individual level, you know, back when um, I left uh, working for um, this conservation group I talked to you about earlier, back in 2004, and um, I was very, um, I, was, I was frustrated, I was angry, I was sad, um, and mad at, 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 simply mad at the conservation movement, at conservation organizations, saying, why aren't you doing this work? You keep on talking about, keep on hearing people talk about diversity, this or that, but I don't see anything, it's not changing, I still feel like crap, right? Other people of color still feel like crap, too. Um, 
And you know what changed? Nothing. Nothing changed. And that just got me more frustrated, right? But when I stopped, and there were a number of points in my evolution and my growth in this work, when I stopped and started to do my own work, then I could see how I could be more effective with the people around me. And then, and then, and then building this organization later on, oh my gosh, we can start doing this on a broader scale. I couldn't get to that point unless I did my work for it first. The Center for Diversity and Environment didn't start until 2008, so there's a big gap in what, what was I doing from 2004 to 2008. I was growing. Um, I went to uh, uh, dismantling racism training. I actually hosted it through the Environmental Leadership Program. I was a fellow. We had money to do a project. That was my project, and I said, this is my first attempt at trying to change. I'm going to bring in emerging leaders, and they're going to do their work and get trained up, and then they're going to go off and change the world. Right? And little did I realize that it was actually a gift for me as well. Um, because I participated in that training. And it's the most impactful professional experience for me. And is a core piece of why I do the work I do today. And why we create these leadership development programs especially. Um, so starting on the individual level, um, it all comes back to me. It all comes back to you. What can you do on an individual level? So I want to start by just talking about the, uh, it, this, it's not going to go linear for us individual organizational. We're going to start a little bit on the organizational and then I'm going to, I'm going to end and, and work and talk to you about the individual level. So um, on the organizational level, um, I just want to broaden our minds of what you can do um, as, as for the Society of Conservation Biology as well as your home institutions. What can you do? Um, on internally, um, recruitment and retention. How do you create that inclusive culture? How do you have ongoing training and learning? Um, also on an external level, um, how are you building relationships with communities um, across difference, um, especially the ones you don't see or you don't often work with? Um, how do you partner? Uh, what is the educational pathway that you're providing? These are all areas that you could start working on. You could start working on now, and I know many of you have work plans, and the brilliant thing about diversity is you can integrate it in, into anything you do. If your job is to reach out and work with communities, why don't we add a few communities that you haven't been working with traditionally? Communities of color, the local community, um, whatever that might be. So we said we talked to you a little bit about what is diversity, why diversify, and um, what, what are some of the challenges, and then what can we do. And um, we just saw a really big, nice graph about um, what that might mean in the abstract, but we think it's important for us to be thinking about these issues in relation to the Society for Conservation Biology. So this graphic came out this week. I don't know if anybody else caught this. This is the gender composition of scholarly publications from the last 20 years. What patterns do you see? If the pinkish color is girls and the bluish color is boys, what pattern are you seeing here? OK, I got a thumbs down. So essentially what we see is that um, <laughs> only just shy of 5,000 people who have done publishing out of 2,300 uh, people, uh, 23,000 people, I'm sorry, um, are women and then 17,440 are men. You also see that in the author position, I think most of us would argue that the first and the second positions and some, most of us or some of us the last positions are the positions of power, the people who are the leads uh, in thought or, or uh, in the labs. Um, fewer than 20%, 22% uh, uh, of women are authors in the first position. You can see it starts to rise when you get to seven and eight and then really plummets when you think about the last author. Um, it may, that may be a, a, um, an issue related to our discipline that um, the, the lead is the second author, but even, either, even so, um, women are um, <coughs> significantly um, underrepresented in the first author position. I'd argue that there are even things that are going on in our annual meetings. For instance, I've been in a number of events where parents have had to leave because they've had children and there wasn't access to childcare. Um, we are um, we're privileging people who have children, who have people who can take care of their children, and we're, fi we're 
finding that young professionals with children can't fully participate in these meetings. So we need to think about um, having enough time to think ahead in our conference arenas and find those that support childcare. Um, I'd love to get us get up, get up and running, ro uh, moving our bodies around again. So what I want you to do is to think about these four categories. And I know that a lot of you fit between these categories, but if you can think of which one of these is your primary affiliation, who you identify with the most. Are you a manager who's on the ground doing work every day, implementing um, biodiversity conservation work? Are you a policymaker who's thinking about ways that we can engage a large set, set of people at the national or international level in caring for and thinking about um, biodiversity conservation in the um, in uh, the policy arena? Do you work for a national or international NGO as a staff member? Um, or are you an academic who's creating the research that helps us to make better decisions um, in conservation? So if you would mind standing up, I know there are gonna be people who don't fit in all in any four of these categories, so do your best. <laughs> um, so people who are managers, if you could just stand up right now, please. You don't have to tweet. All right, so if you're a policymaker, could you stand up, please? No, keep, keep standing up, managers, actually, it's fine. Policymakers. Okay, national and, or international NGO staff members. And how about the academics? Aha. So I know that this doesn't represent the entire society, nor does it, sadly, represent everybody who came to this meeting. Um, but I think you might have seen some patterns. What did you see? A lot of academics. A lot of academics. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess one of the things I've noticed a lot when we write about conservation in our journals, in the journal Conservation Biology, we've had a lot of discussions about that. At the end of the papers, we often say, here's the reason why my, my research is important. Manager should, blah, 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 blah. And we don't, we, we think of this group as these generic managers. There's no single manager out there. There are a lot of different kind of managers and we aren't necessarily targeting our work as effectively as we can to managers. And I would argue that one of those reasons is because we're not engaging them at the beginning of our work, in the process of developing the work that we're doing, our experimental design or the research that you're doing, nor are as many as we would like coming to these meetings. So those are some things we need to be thinking about as well in terms of diversity and representation in the Society for Conservation Biology. So on Tuesday, we had a really wonderful um, meeting on being biodiverse and thinking about the experiences of people who are traditionally underrepresented in conservation science. Um, that was run by Alexandra Sutton and Ray Wingrant. Um, and they came up with some categories of things that people were hearing, that they were hearing from people. They felt that uh, for, as members of the Society of Conservation Biology, there were poor experiences in mentor-mentee relationships, that many of them um, didn't grow up going outside and, and um, being a part of nature, and therefore they felt that they were being told that conservation biology wasn't for them. There were a lot of feelings of isolation even at SCB meetings, um, and so there's a lot we can be doing to uh, increase our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And on the, yesterday, we had a lunchtime workshop uh, run by Mary Blair and myself where we actually started to think about what some of those recommendations can be. So we have some very specific recommendations right now. We think that the Society for Conservation Biology needs a diversity committee, which is very exciting since yesterday they announced a diversity committee, um, a new diversity committee. Yay. And that committee can really be thinking, doing a needs assessment and, and putting together a diversity plan for what SCB should do. We also need to think about diversity training at leadership levels um, so that we can continue on with this idea and we don't just develop a plan that sits on the shelf. Um, and uh, we need to think about integrated pathways, what in the United States we sometimes think of as pipelines, but we're not comfortable with that because it seems very linear. Um, pathways for students that include fellowships, grants, what's called near-peer mentoring, people who are just coming out of a particular stage in their career who can help people who are just coming into that stage. Professional development and leadership training. We do some of this, but we need to really ramp this up and really find ways to include more people who are traditionally not represented in our um, society. We need outreach to NGOs and government agencies and to be thinking with them on understanding the challenges and opportunities, and in particular to outreach to NGOs, government agencies, and universities 
who are serving or are specialized in um, the diversity or, or in um, individuals at this point who are traditionally underrepresented. We also need to think about targeted marketing, recruitment, and equitable partnerships with these organizations so that we can grow our membership with people from um, uh, organizations like the minority serving institutions in the United States and other organizations all around the world. So our vision for a diverse Society for Cons Conservation Biology membership is that we are, uh, our membership will be opened to different decision-making pathways towards effective biodiversity conservation, that we would maximize reflection during decision-making, and that we would consider different priorities, values, knowledge, and perspectives. We would listen deeply, and we wouldn't block out options that are based on preconceptions. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit at, at the individual level, because um, some of the things I've been saying, it's kind of like, oh, you know, it's, it's kind of heady, conceptual, okay, yeah, I do my own work, I go through training, I read some things. What does that actually mean? And I want to um, share with you um, some examples. So this, this is our, one of our most recent cohorts, the environment, in our Environment 24, Environment 2042, not 3,506, whatever that was. <laughs> Environment 2042 Leadership Program. Um, and they do some work. Um, we, we work them through a process. We try to put together as diverse a cohort as possible um, of environmental leaders and diversity change agents across, across the country, as diverse on all levels age, gender, race, ethnicity. There is a honed-in focus of trying to achieve at least 50% people of color, since that's our focus around racial and ethnic diversity. So we bring them together for two retreats and um, coaching sessions over a three-month-long process. Um, and they dive deep. It's eight, eight days in session. They dive deep into the history of, of race and racism in the United States. And what does that mean for us today? What is the legacy of, of that history in the United States? How is it playing out today? How are we seeing things institutionalized and systemized? What do we see and what can we do about it? So through the process, through building a diverse cohort, they learn how to work across difference and how to be a team and how to be a, um, a, a cohort that can, that can they, they grapple. So it's not pretty sometimes. Sometimes people leave. They leave the room. Sometimes people leave altogether. We've lost a couple people. I'm not happy about that. But it's not for lack of trying on our end to try and work with them. Um, and they do their work. And in the end, they work on relationship building. They work on deep learning and understanding. And we also work on action planning with them. So a lot of these folks are, and that's what we see like, as a change agent in this work. Someone who's committed to this work to continued learning and is moving the mantle forward. So I want to share, um, this is a typical um, response. And, and again, I, there's learning for, for us. That, that's our third cohort we hosted. And we're, you know, when we're applying to grants, we think about linear. These are the outcomes. This is going to, X, Y, Z is going to happen. They're all going to have action plans, and they're going to be effective. I don't know what those action plans look like, because they're each going to do their own, and they're just going to move it forward. And I could, we could report the specific actions, building relationships with communities of color, um, hiring, creating inclusive culture systems within an organization. We could list those out. One of the big learning pieces for us coming back is the learning from the process itself. People are shifted, changed, transformed. They don't do the work they do in the same way anymore. So I want to share one response. And this is, and again, this is typical. I can share all 20 of them from that cohort. This leadership program has been a life-changing experience, life-changing in many ways. I used to hear the phrase equity lens and kind of convince myself that I understood intellectually what that meant. But I never really fully felt never felt that I fully grasped the true definition and what it would feel like to truly view the world through that lens. I felt that it was a viewpoint that I could or had to turn on and off for the appropriate situation. Through this experience, I have learned that an equity lens, once graced with it, is the only way to view everything all the time in all that I do. So imagine that. 
Imagine if we were a movement, a society, where people are seeing these inequities. Some of us do. We see these every day, but not everybody does. That's kind of the answer, my answer before. Like, why, why do we not know about this information that people of color care about the environment? Because some of us see that and some of us don't. And there's real privilege in not being able, in not seeing that. But there's real damaging, there's a damage there when we don't see things that are right in front of us. Um, so this is what I see as part of this moving forward, being a change agent, doing your individual work. So what is needed of you? So I talk about this individual level work in action. What is needed of you? Leadership. Many of you are leaders in the conservation field. You're, you're, you're paving your way through there or you're, you're eventually moving your way up. So when I'm talking about leadership, I'm not talking about your title. I'm talking about you walk in the talk and leading on diversity and equity and inclusion. And what this means, this commitment, means it's going to, you're going to continually, how do you continually move yourself forward on understanding and being effective at this work? I'm still trying to move forward. There's never going to be a time and place where I'm going to check a box and say, I'm an expert, I'm done. My work's done, I gotta go home. Right? There's never going to be a time that that's going to happen. So how do you, how do you walk the talk um, of moving your mantle forward for yourself? Ongoing learning. Continue to challenge yourself around, around this work. Uh, read, work, read, read, um, read, go to trainings, go to workshops. Continue to challenge yourself. Informed action. So while you're doing that ongoing learning, what does this mean for you in your daily life? How are you going to move the mantle forward? This, this piece I used to, this used to always be, um, it's not up there anymore. Um, I call informed action. I used to always just say action. And then I've, I've got a lot of people who are very excited about doing this work, and they move forward. They're not prepared. Uh, they don't do their homework. It's like, a, um, it's like a surgeon doing surgery without the training, right? And then they go out there, and sometimes they shoot themselves in the foot. They end up negatively impacting the very group that they didn't intend, that they wanted to positively impact. So I strongly recommend do your learning, inform yourself on what you're, the, wherever you're going to do and what you're going to focus on before you take action. And the last thing is this work asks for you to engage your head and your heart. And I know many of us are in, in our society, at least in the United States, um, and many of us in our workplaces ask us to engage our head every single day. Great at analyzing things, uh, criticizing things. Um, but this work takes your heart as well. And especially compassion and empathy. And it may be all sound all fluffy to some of you, but I'll tell you over and over, compassion and empathy has won out. I even have had, had challenges around that. I'm like, you know what? This guy, and I'm, I'm going to be straightforward with you because these are the things that happen in, in my head and my self talk in this work. Because I haven't had a lot of positive interactions with white men sometimes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be blunt and put that out there. So there's times when I have when there's this group I worked with and a white man was blocking the movement forward on a diversity effort. He's a top leader in this organization. And initially my response was, I'm not going to talk to him because he's a white man. A white man usually think that everything's about them. This is my self-talk. White man, I love you. This is my self-talk. <laughs> this, this is me doing my own work, okay? So I'm verbalizing what's inside me, okay? Um, um, he thinks it's all about himself. He's trying to bring the attention on him when it should be about everybody in, in, in this organization. So I'm not going to stoop to that. I'm not going to give him attention. I'm going to ignore him, and I'm going to try and work with the rest of the people to move this effort forward. How do you think that worked out for me? It didn't work well, right? And so I'm like, you know, what's that slide I tell people? <laughs> um, compassion, yes. Compassion and empathy. Maybe there's something going on for him. Because he's actually a leader in many ways out in the community, working, uh, connecting uh, conservations with com communities of color. So it really baffled me. Why is this person blocking this effort? So I had a discussion with him. And I approached it with curiosity and inquiry and asked and held back all that self-talk because um, a lot of assumptions were coming through there. And I had to call myself out on that. 
And so when I ended and then I connected with compassion and empathy, I figured out what some of the issues were for him and we're able to work it out. And now they're an organization that's moving forward and he's fully on board and supportive. So that's just one example where compassion has won out. I want to share this quote by Mahatma Gandhi. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. We need not wait to see what others do. This really speaks to me in this work about doing our, our own work first. We can't wait. We can't wait for others to create this vision, my own personal vision. How can we take ownership on that and move, move the mantle forward, knowing that maybe we won't be doing this, we won't be getting there overnight, but, but what can we do to move forward? So I want to come back to Michael. I, I, personally, I don't know him, but I feel him. I can feel, uh, sorry, I can feel the legacy of his work. And that's what's amazing about it. He faced the challenge and he did something about it. He created a program. He built a strong relationship with Eleanor. He affected all of us here today, but just by who he is affected John in, 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 in supporting and having this keynote. And you know what's great about that? It all stemmed from a simple decision he made. He faced, I know it's not that simple because I know he was feeling some things. But he made a decision. I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to move the mantle forward. So what Eleanor and I ask of you today is what is your role in moving the mantle forward? What is your Michael moment? Creating a program? Connecting with someone across difference? What is that moment for you to move the mantle forward? Because change starts right here, right now, many of you, or continuing for many of you. Um, and every one of you have the personal power to engage and move these issues forward. Because as one of my favorite quotes, it's an African proverb, states, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I want to go far, so let's go together. Salamat. Thank you. So again, I want to thank our plenary speakers um, for a very inspiring um, plenary. Thank you. Just, do you want to take some questions? I can, yeah. 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 Just a couple of quick announcements and then we can take some questions since we're into the break. Um, so uh, for those of you who are in pub crawl, pub crawl group number two, please see Kat outside in the lobby. I have no idea why, but she wanted me to say that. Um, for those um, student, award, um, st student award finalists who didn't get their book, please see Kat as well um, in the lobby. And a reminder, the break is outside of room 307 and 310 um, right now. So, but let's take, for those of you who are interested, let's um, take some questions and have a discussion. Thank you. go to the mic. And also remember that ICCB, hashtag ICCB diversity is a place you can actually exchange ideas and information across this since that's out there now and we can tweet back and forth. In the front row here. I wonder if you guys can speak to the common challenges that you have heard of or impediments to instigating diversity measures within conservation programs. Do you hear that it's not important, that it's not relevant, that it's not a problem? What do you guys hear? 
So the question is, uh, within conservation programs, do we have any commonalities in what we've heard about um, in terms of when we bring up ideas or, or think about implementing conservation programs? I've certainly heard why a lot, that people aren't necessarily familiar with um, some of the things we brought up previously about broadening your audience can help you to do a better job with the work that you need to get done. Um, so someone's ready at the mic. Oh. Did you want to yeah, say something Yeah, I wanted too? to say a couple things. Yeah, um, two, two, Tom, there's a bunch of things that pop up, but two things that popped up in my head is, is leadership is very important um, for any organization to move forward. If the leader is not bo on board, then it's very difficult to move it forward because they need to own it, lead it, and model it. Um, the second piece is one thing I often hear, especially from nonprofits, is, is it's mission drift. Um, when in fact it's, there's, there's all these mistruths out there, when in fact diversity is actually uh, mission critical. It's part of your mission. It should be part of your mission. Unless your mission states, and this is coming from my white colleague, if, unless the mission states you're saving land for white people, then, um, then your mission doesn't say you're, you're, you have to exclude other people, right? Um, so, yeah. Question. Pia Ibish, representative of the Europe section of the society. Thank you very much for this talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Just a little comment from outside, like from the European continent. Mm -hmm. The talk reflected pretty much a North American perspective. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe I missed it, did not hear the word sections. I guess this is a great potential for the society in diversifying, get the uh, sections empowered. Absolutely. And in fact, un underneath that small list of five things that I said about the diversity plan and what SEV needs to do next, you're absolutely correct. And I, I just summarize it as in, in reaching out locally in regional networks, but sections, are, sections and chapters are really important. And actually, I want to challenge that because I don't actually think that what we were talking about was specifically North American. In fact, um, Marcelo's talk was about statistics and the work that he's doing in the North American perspective, but I was definitely talking internationally and generally. So, so I feel like we can generalize, generalize from a lot of the things that we were saying. This the whole concept of how people work together in a more diverse, in a, in a more uh, sorry, more effective in a diverse group resonates across SCB um, globally. I would say, yeah. and love to talk to you about the European <laughs> section. Yeah. Hi again. Thank you for your talk. Um, I had a comment and a question too. Um, we talked a lot about racial divide in this in this talk and and mobilizing that group, but also possibly a correlated but something that is also equally underutilized is the the massive divide between socioeconomic status in this country, especially and and the conservation movement. I've read multiple times where it says the conservation movement or the climate change movement is predominantly an upper middle class or an upper class problem. And the people that seem to would be affected by that the most are the people that aren't involved in this conversation at all. And I mean, looking around this room, we, have, we certainly have a diverse group of people, but I would probably generalize that most of us, except maybe for some of the graduate students, are predominantly above the poverty, poverty, poverty line, excuse me. Um, do you have any comments on how you, your work may be, has addressed some of these issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, w one thing is we, we hone in on racial and ethnic diversity, so I'm trying to provide, first of all, expertise and knowledge in that area. Um, not, to, not to say that, it, that other forms of, of diversity interventions are not important. I don't want that assumption to come across at all. Uh, we just feel that there's this special, or there's something, I, I wish there were actually organizations in all these different levels. <laughs> like I wish, and, and, I, and I would actually see that the environmental justice movement in the, in the United States uh, is, is, is tackling head on the, um, the socioeconomic lower, uh, poor, especially people of color. Um, and I also want to share that, that all of these dimensions of diversity, while we kind of you know, we try to isolate, you can't really. So when you're working with on, on racial diversity, um, there's all this other diversity that comes up and bubbles up. And there is a strong tie of so, uh, socioeconomic level and, and race in, in here in the United States as well. And that comes up in our conversations all the time. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. That's really good. And, and, and again, 
from the lens of the Society of Constitution Biology, um, one of the things that Alex and Ray's group brought up was that it would be really useful and interesting for um, those of the, the for groups for, for when we have a um, a meeting in a place that we reach out to those individuals and the groups that represent those individuals in place. Baltimore would have been a great place if the organizing committee had had more time. I'm, I'm sure they would have done that. Um, knowing them as I do, um, I think we were constrained a little bit in what we could do here, but it allows for um, an aspiration to other groups in France and in, um, and in, Boze in Montana to, to really think about who uh, from a socioeconomic level has not um, part of our part of part of the site for conservation biology, and, and we're in place in the location where we have a wonderful group of people with stories and messages and a passion for um, biodiversity, and we can really do a great job of of improving on that. So that's I, I'm gonna every every question you ask me, I'm gonna say that's part of the diversity plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take notes. Take notes. Um, anybody who wants to chat, I think um, kind of has to come up. To, kind of has to come up to the microphone, right, as we've step heard. Up to the mic. Thanks. Um, the Ecological Society of America has an environmental justice chapter or section. I don't exactly know what they call it. Um, is that like something the SCB could consider? Because I mean, the, the the board having a committee is great, but that's going to be a small s number of people. So whereas if there was a section or a chapter that was to cover something like this that other members of the society could engage in, yeah. um, it might be a more powerful way to mobilise. I'm going to take people. an operational response to that, and then there might be a conceptual response as well. So, but okay. um, yeah. thanks. That's a really great idea. And what, what I want to emphasize, um, maybe I'm going out of my bounds, but I'm going to watch Rodrigo while I'm talking. <laughs> the vision is that the committee itself is about spurring other things. So the committee will be creating um, activities and, and other um, adventures for the Society of Conservation Biology. So that's a really important one. I do think that the Ecological Society of America is a group that we could look to in terms of some of the things they've done and done successfully. I also want to be careful that um, we find ways to reach out to diversity um, and allow for people to not necessarily be, um, uh, for environmental justice not to be one of the main ways that we connect with particularly people of color because that, that can be a stereotype as well. So I think it's useful for us to have that but lots of other things that people of color in the United States and um, people who are underrepresented around the world globally can engage, so. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, he's good. good. Yeah. Okay, I think probably we'll be polite and just take one more because I know you guys probably want to get a little bit of break before the four o'clock um, talks. And I want to see Mary, Mary Blair's talk. <laughs> um, thank you, that was a really good talk. Um, I just have one comment. I've always struggled a lot with labels for people mm -hmm. and Throughout my life, I've never been good at identifying people's ethnicities, their races, and it was something that I've actually gotten made fun of or, I've, you know, it's something I've been kind of judged about. But as I got older, I, I actually really appreciate it because I do feel like it makes um, me have the ability to kind of immediately get past that. Like, I don't see someone and have the immediate thought of they're Asian or whatever other label. So my question to you is you talked much about inclusion, but doesn't a label inherently put up a wall? Like now you are male, I'm female, I'm a fleece wearer, you're a polo shirt wearer. <laughs> you know, like it, it just seems like it's an immediately me and you, like mm -hmm. us and them mentality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, thank, thanks for bringing that up. That's actually, a, uh, I hear that comment more than often than not. At, that's part, that's part of the work we need to do. And whether, whether I want to label someone or not, labels are happening all the time in society. Um, it's human nature to put people in categories or to categorize. Um, and that's how we got in the kind of the mess we got in today in terms of race. Um, at the beginning, uh, the history of the United States, I won't give you a big lesson, but um, the, the first census came out to start categorizing people to, to who should be privileged and who shouldn't. Um, and so we still have the legacy of that. So to not address and identifying that, I think it's part of our assessment. Not, and do that on not, in a non-judging way. Just say, you know, this is, this is where people are. Um, I, I think that's part of the assessment of then how you, how you can start moving forward and achieving a vision and a move forward plan. Um, but I do understand there is some discomfort in, in labeling, um, I would just say these are our identities, um, and this is just who we are, 
but when you talked about fleece wear, not fleece wear, man, woman, that's important when we have our interactions because there's some, some identities that are more impactful for some of us, some are less, um, not to make assumptions about other people. And, and there's this, um, on the Harvard website, there's this implicit bias test. And no matter how hard, I, I fail even with my own people, with Asian people. No matter how hard you want to not label, your brain is triggered. You're, you're, you're shaped by, the, this is mainly from a US-centric point of view, you're shaped by how you grew up and how society is to label people by race in milliseconds. And, this, this, and so I'd encourage you and anybody here to go to that implicit bias test and, and not only label people, but make assumptions about them. And, and it's part of our work. It's part of what we see on a daily basis, the news we get, the interactions, the comments that mold and shape who we are. So I encourage that. All right, so thank, thank you, you very much, everybody. Good job.